Anyone in Motley Crue will tell you that hard rocking comes with the side order of hard partying, and Nicky Six was probably one of the hardest members in any Motley Crue party. His life wasn't all roses, though. Here's the tragic story of Nicky Six. Before he became Nicky Six, young Frank Farana Jr. had quite a childhood, and it turned him into a hellraiser of an adult. Six was raised jointly by his grandparents and his mother, and had to move a lot. In a span of 11 years, he attended seven schools. This turbulence did not mold him into a particularly law-abiding young man, and when he was living with his grandparents in Jerome, Idaho, his school expelled him for selling drugs. This was the last straw for Grandpa and Grandma Six, who sent the young man to his mother in Seattle. What am I going to do in Seattle? According to Blabbermouth, living with his mother was no picnic for Six, as it came with a side order of violent men. By the time he was 17, the budding musician finally had enough, so he left his past behind and took his bass, his new name, and his big dreams to Los Angeles. Still, his experiences as a young man may have influenced Motley Crue's music. Six has said that the song Livewire in particular is about domestic violence and specifically mentions the assorted stepdads he had to deal with. Nikki Six and his mother have always had a strained relationship, and by strained we mean utterly dysfunctional. According to The Guardian, their troubles started when Six was just six years old and his mother called her parents to come and take the young boy away, allegedly telling her son, I'm going to lock the door and I'll just leave you in the porch. Then she cruised away with the strange man. Six says the moment broke him and he could never truly reconnect with her again. This isn't one of those tales where time heals the wounds and the mother and son eventually reconcile either. The relationship remained so sour that reconciliation was impossible, and when she died in 2013, Six only acknowledged the event with a simple, dispassionate tweet. He had been fully aware of her condition, but felt that even at the brink of death, she didn't deserve any attention from him. Nikki Six was a particularly enthusiastic drug user during the band's glory days, so he's had more than his share of close calls. Still, none of them can hold a candle to December 23, 1987, the day he died. Ultimate Classic Rock says that after a night of hard partying with some hard-rocking friends, including members of Guns N' Roses and Rat, the festivities were slowly winding down. However, Six decided to treat himself to one last hit before bedtime. This proved to be a fatal mistake, because he passed out and started turning blue. Paramedics arrived, but it looked like they couldn't do anything to save the bassist. Six was loaded in an ambulance and given shots of adrenaline, but he was already dead, or so it seemed. Hours later, he unexpectedly awoke at a hospital, cursed at a cop trying to ask him questions, and wandered out, wearing nothing but leather pants. He got a ride home, and a lecture about drugs, from two fans who had just heard on the radio that he had died. Six has described dying as a fairly typical out-of-body experience experience, and he's also said that death just hurts. Unfortunately, even death wasn't enough for him to break the drug habit. I stopped for about three hours. To illustrate how out of it Nikki Six was during the late 1980s, look no further than the train incident during Motley Crue's tour in Japan. Ultimate Classic Rock reports they took a bullet train from Tokyo to Osaka for a concert, but as it turned out, it was not a good idea to put the world's most dangerous rock band on the same train as mere mortals. During the return trip, Six was out of his mind while Mick Mars was busy swimming in a bottle of Jack Daniels. The two started to get on each other's nerves, and Six started throwing donuts at Mars. After a bit of that, the bassist decided to graduate to throwing bottles and misjudged a toss and hit a random man in the head. And it goes to the front and smashes the window and comes crashing down on these nice little Japanese people. When the train arrived in Tokyo, a couple of hundred cops were waiting in riot gear. They arrested Six and the band's manager, who both spent hours in jail while a local promoter tried to resolve the issue. Somehow, he managed to persuade the police to release them on the condition that Six write a letter of apology. During his worst heroin abuse years, Nikki Six had near-death experiences and went through pretty much all imaginable terrors that come with drug addiction. Still, he doesn't consider any of his assorted dramatic drug-using incidents as his rock bottom. For Six, his absolute lowest point was a fairly uneventful and intimate moment that only registered as an absolute darkest hour because he finally realized the hopelessness of his situation. According to The Fix, the realization came when his dealer was temporarily out of stock and he had no access to heroin. The bassist spent a day and a half without heroin in terrible, painful withdrawal that he likens to hell before his dealer was able to come over and resupply his addiction. This incident made Six realize he couldn't get out, and that information hit him so hard that he describes the sensation as an almost physical feeling of being stuck. 
It's easy to assume that Nikki Six is always going to be the most debauched person in any given relationship, but he once met his match in a pop star known as Vanity. She was a model, actress, and singer who was originally discovered, mentored, and dated by none other than Prince. By the time she met Six, her career was already dwindling. The two shared a mutual love of drugs and got engaged in 1987. This was not a good move, as both of them were extremely fond of rock star excesses and enabled each other's bad behavior. They would stay up all night, and in the morning, Six would throw Vanity out because she started acting too crazy for him. Vanity eventually moved on from her famous fiancé. She continued her hard partying ways until 1994, when a massive overdose caused a renal failure that nearly killed her. After that, she abandoned her stage name and became a Christian evangelist under her real name, Denise Matthews. Unfortunately, her years of abuse had wrecked her health beyond repair, and she died at age 57 in 2016. A marriage to a young, restless Motley Crue member doesn't come with much stability and security, and Nikki Six has the divorces to prove it. Although he's a dedicated family man these days, the bass man had to trudge through two failed marriages to get there. According to heavy metal site Blabbermouth, his second marriage to Donna D'Errico ended in 2007. The divorce proceedings turned nasty when Six testified that he had discovered that she had previously been a stripper and even done some high-end call-girl work. This sordid past thoroughly freaked out noted Saint Nikki Six, according to Nikki Six. D'Errico's lawyers, on the other hand, dismissed his claims as little more than an amusing attempt at character assassination. I have a strict policy against mixing business with pleasure. Are we clear on that? The fate of Brandy Brandt, the musician's first wife and the mother of three of his children, was less amusing. Biography says her seven-year marriage to Six ended in 1996, and perhaps not coincidentally, Six married D'Errico just one month later. Brandt's life then took a very dark and strange turn. The Sydney Morning Herald says the former Playboy cover girl became involved in a large cocaine smuggling conspiracy, and she was sentenced to several years in prison in 2014. Nikki Six has tons of opinions and a history of substance abuse issues, and he has carved out a career in a field full of people with similar temperaments and preferences. As such, Six seems to attract and cultivate feuds like a gardener might nurture fine flowers. According to rock music site Loudwire, the Motley Crue bassist has varying levels of beef with Michael Sweet of Striper, the band Kiss, and Gene Simmons in particular. According to Ultimate Classic Rock, Sebastian Bach of Skid Row fame says he can't even keep up with all the feuds Six has going. The Crue bassist most long-term target is none other than Metallica. According to Loaded Radio, the two bands have been at odds since they rose to dominate their respective metal scenes at the same time in the same general area. And Six has been known to take pot shots at the band's drummer Lars Ulrich for his appearance, attitudes, and drumming ability. Of course, this could just be because Six likes to annoy drummers. After all, even his own percussionist isn't safe from his inflammatory antics. According to Metal Injection, Tommy Lee says Six unfollowed him on Twitter immediately after Motley Crue's final show. The star describes how, at the height of Motley Crue's fame, Nikki Six spent many a long night in a way you'd never expect a rock star to. Instead of drowning his worries in a mountain of groupies and fast cars, the bass player curled up in a cold, damp closet with drugs and a shotgun. According to the AV Club, the reason for his behavior was paranoia. Six was certain the cops were coming to get him, and the fact that he reacted to the imminent presence of law enforcement by getting as wasted as humanly possible and arming himself shows just how out of it he was at the time. During his worst moments of heroin addiction, this was actually closer to his status quo than all the happy-go-lucky partying and gleeful depravity described in the dirt. His own memoir, The Heroin Diaries, functions largely as a document of this awful dark side of the rock star life style. 1988 was perhaps the most infamous year for Motley Crue and Nikki Six. The peak of both their popularity and the basis heroin addiction, that year was full of rowdiness, health scares, cancelled concerts, and trouble with the law. On top of all this chaos, a man named Matthew Tripp emerged with a strange story. Music site Louder says Tripp was a relatively unknown musician who claimed he had a secret history as the bass player for Crew. Not a new member, mind you. He said he literally spent a year as Nikki Six. According to Tripp, Six was sidelined due to a nasty car accident in 1982. He says guitarist Mick Mars recruited the similar-looking Tripp to take over the bass responsibilities in 1983, starting a gig as Nikki Six. 2.0 that ended in 1984, when Tripp was involved in an armed robbery. As he was waiting for his trial, the real Six rejoined the band, and they went on to record songs that Tripp claims he wrote, such as Save Our Souls. 
Of course, Tripp's tales turned out to be pretty tall. Although he does seem to have believed the whole thing himself, he still managed to keep a lawsuit against the band's manager going for a few years, and the bogus story received some significant publicity. Nikki Six has been open about the fact that he struggled with depression in his youth, and he says taking drugs was partially an attempt to self-medicate the condition. He takes depression very seriously, to the point that he even included its medical definition in the glossary of the heroin diaries. Still, his most public foray at addressing the subject was actually prompted by Gene Simmons. In 2014, the KISS ringleader made some controversial comments about depression, dismissing its validity as a mental disorder and saying that people who claim they're depressed should should just take their lives. This was a colossally stupid comment, and Six immediately jumped in the fray. According to Rolling Stone, the Motley Crue man labeled Simmons' comments moronic and pointed out that some kid might actually hear his words and believe that suicide is the only way out. Six then went on to carefully explain that there are many, many ways out of depression, and the last thing any depressed person should have to do is hear some rock star claiming that there is only one final way to deal with the situation. It's probably not a coincidence that Simmons released a swift and uncharacteristically humble apology. If you or anyone you know is having suicidal thoughts, please call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-TALK.